Okay, so um, back from the midterm. I uh, hope everyone has had a chance to look at their scores and the solution sets. Um, after you look at your scores and your solution sets and the individual responses, things like that, if you have any questions, feel, feel free to let me know. Um, uh, otherwise, kind of moving forward here, um, now we're sort of in the back half of the class where we've learned the basics of modeling. And so in this first um, section here, we're going to be talking about how to make these computational models uh, more realistic, more complex. And uh, so that's kind of this unit. And then after this unit, we'll uh, then start looking at you know, kind of case studies of where dynamical systems modeling, modeling has been used to gain insights into a lot of problems that many of them kind of relate to sustainability. And so we'll kind of see those, those examples. And that'll also help give us practice in building out these, um, these equations and how to model these things, which will be important as you go into your final project. As I mentioned online, um, looking at, to make sure that you've got your teams submitted um, by, I think it was um, by this Sunday, um, and so if you're having trouble finding team members, I encourage you to take a look at that Google spreadsheet, either reach out to people who've already put their names on there or put your name on there. If you've already put your name on there, go back to the spreadsheet and, um, and reach out to people who have added themselves. Otherwise, feel free to post on the discussion boards, uh, feel free to post on a Slack, et cetera, um, you know, however you'd like to, to make those connections. So we're looking for teams nominally, shoot for four people, really like to see mostly four person teams, but occasionally a three-person team uh, will be uh, acceptable, but it'll be uh, better for the experience if we can get them to four-person teams. All right, so um, any questions about that from in-class or online? Okay, so, uh, so in that case, then sort of moving forward, uh, one of the first things we're gonna do then is in VinSim and Insight Maker, learn how to do some basic embellishments where um, we're going to learn about units and lookup tables will kind of be our primary things today. And then on Tuesday, delays. And so let's, uh, let's see what that looks like. So both of these platforms have support for units. We haven't used them so far, but um, we've talked about this idea of dimensional analysis um, in some more, the uh, previous Moorcroft chapter, where if we specify units, then Vincent and Insight Maker can help sort of keep us honest um, in when we're doing these expressions. So if we put an expression together and the unit doesn't come out to what it's supposed to be, then Vincent or Insight Maker will say, hey, I think maybe some of your logic might be wrong or some of your units are wrong. Can you go and double check? And so it's a good thing for what we refer to as verification um, and validation. So, um, so the first unit that is uh, we have seen is under the model settings in VinSim, um, where you set your time step, and then a little bit down here, you have this units for time, second um, is what's selected here. And so far, that's just been the thing that's been on the x-axis of these behavior uh, over time plots. Um, but we want to see, uh, you know, other units that we can, we can go into here. And so um, inside the equations in VinSim, and I could open up VinSim and do this as well if that's helpful, but this is the same equations um, box that you've seen. It's a little bit cleaner in the newer version of uh, Vincent, but it's the same basic idea. And up at the top, there is a unit that we've so far um, left alone. And so what we can do is we can pull drill down on those units and we'll see that there's a bunch of provided units like DMNL, that's just a uh, synonym for dimension list. There's also time units like second, minutes, et cetera. But then you can actually go and put in your own units in there and it knows what a slash is. So if you do meters per second, it knows that that's two units. That's uh, sort of a, a quantity unit meter divided by a time unit. And so um, because it understands that, then inside the expressions that you type in inside this box, then it will expect um, that you'd effectively be doing a division or multiplying an existing unit that's meters per second um, and, you know, using that through. So um, it doesn't understand the word per, but it does understand the slash. And so you can just type in your own units there, meters per second, meters, germs, germs per month, and so on. You can just put that up there into that uh, units field. And, um, and then you can click this check units button. I'm just... Uh, trying to get a hold of my mouse here so that I can 
All right. Um, so uh, this check units that's up here, if you click that, it will then look at the expressions that you've typed in and it'll verify the consistency to say that, yep, you wanted this to be meters per second and the expressions you've typed in here are meters per second. So that's a quick way to check on your equations. That's one way to do that. And then, let's see, I think I somehow got out of Excel or a PowerPoint. Let me see if I can get back. Um, yeah, okay, and then um, and then you can also specify unit equivalents. And so um, it's really a drag to say like every time you wanna use meters, you have to use meters and not meter because sometimes it's just gonna, feel right to do meter and not meters. Sometimes it'll be meters. So sometimes you want to use a singular, sometimes you want to use a plural. Sometimes you might want to use centimeters. Sometimes you might want to use kilometers. So if you go back to that model settings where we normally are just worried about like under time bounds where we've got all those, the parameters like time step, there's a tab over here called units equivalent. And on the new version, I think it's, um, you know, it might be down the side here, but it's the same thing as there. And what you can do under unit equivalence is you can set up synonyms where you can say that like um, I can use a dollar bill, the word dollar, the word dollars, or um, dollar, sorry, a, a dollar sign S. And all of those mean the same thing. I can use day or days, and all of those mean the same thing, and so on and so forth. And so you can click add, and you can add these synonyms here. And that allows you to use any of the synonyms anywhere throughout the model and then sim will just replace it with, you know, it, it basically knows that those are all equivalent. So internally, it'll view those all as the same unit. So that allows you to use the singular sometimes, the plural some other times and so on. What we'll see is in Insight Maker, it gets even fancier where you can actually specify mathematical synonyms. So you can say that a kilometer is 1000 meters. So in that case, you can actually sort of scale your units as well. Whereas um, here, um, there's no uh, mathematical equivalence. It's just purely like, what's the plural form? What's the singular form? That's all that's being done kind of here. But does everybody see what I mean by synonyms? So this is just a way to tell Vincent that when I say either of these words, I mean the same unit. And you can put in as many synonyms as you like. You can edit the existing list. I think it's blank by default but then you can add uh, your own as well. And then you can use those throughout. If you don't set this up and you do a week somewhere and a week's plural somewhere else, then Vincent will say, hey, there's a units mismatch. And uh, then you have to go in and set up this synonym. Okay. Uh, I see a question, are these settings global across projects or on a per project basis? This is a question from the chat. Uh, it's a good question. These are um, per model. Um, I think that um, you can make these down here, see where it says, make these synonyms, the new model default synonyms. You can do that. And then that will make them the default across all new model, but not any existing models. So the, the new model defaults, I think, um, start out as blank. You can change them so that all new models use whatever you put in here. You can replace these with whatever the current new model defaults are, but Generally, when you're adding these here, these are just within the current model, not all models. Okay, any other questions? All right. Um, now, um, I showed you I can do a units check on an individual equation. Across the whole model, you can do a units check as well. So you put in all your equations and before you wanna run it, then you can go up to model in VinSim and go down to unit check. And, and by the way, the first, uh, there's a homework that's available um, that uh, you can uh, start working on. It's not technically, I think, released um, until I think maybe uh, Tuesday, but the first question you'll be able to do after today. And the first question involves using units. So uh, you'll get a chance to practice this. So under the model menu, you can go down to unit check and it will go through all of your, uh, your expressions throughout the entire model and see if everything matches up. And if it, don't, it doesn't, it'll throw up an error and it'll tell you where you need to make those edits. So that's a way to check for unit consistency automatically. All right, so that's how we do it in VinSim. And I also wanna show you how to do it in Insight Maker. So any questions about the VinSim? If anybody needs me to show you it in the actual VinSim, I can, no trouble, you know, popping up VinSim and showing you here. Um, in the, the newer uh, interface, but um, otherwise they're very similar to these screenshots. Okay, all right, so Insight Maker has got this as well. 
Um, the older version of Inside Maker at the very top, it had settings. Now I think it's a little gearbox, but it's the same idea. And if you go up to here um, inside those settings, then um, as before, you got your simulation time step, but they also have the default time units, just like Vinsim, and you can set those. Now, you can also set units um, in the each individual expression for flows, uh, for variables, and for stock initial conditions. Uh, and here, I've actually replaced these with screenshots from the new version because this, um, the old version has, is significantly different looking in where units are located. So I, I really did have to go through and just redo these slides. Um, so that's why it looks a little different than some of the rest of these slides where I didn't go and rebuild the models. But uh, so the idea here is if you draw a simple model here, if you click on either um, any variable in here, so a stock, a flow, or an auxiliary variable, if you click on any of those, um, then on the right-hand side, you get this little editing pane that allows you to edit the expressions here. And we've seen that if you click this little box up here, it'll give you an expanded view so you have more room to type. Um, we see that if you start typing in here, if you have access to variables, they'll pop up down here. And it even gives you a little stigma that pops up that if you hit that, um, it actually shows you a bunch of functions that you're allowed to use. So this is, uh, you know, that. So here I've got a flow rate that I've put in one down here. If I look down a little bit farther, um, and notice I had this, I left at the default, the only positive rates. I normally turn that off. Um, it's just good practice to turn that off, but I just left it at the default for this example. And if I look down here, because this is unit list, it says choose units. If I would have already put a unit in there, it would have actually said the unit. If I click on that choose units, it pops up a new dialog where it has a whole list of units that are already available inside InsideMaker. And so I've expanded some of these so you can't see them, but down even farther here, like this is a scrollable list. It's got like, it also it's like got mass, it's got volume. Um, you know, so here we see distance, area, and volume, and here I'm only seeing distance, but further down, it's got area and volume. Like I said, further down even than that, it's got things like mass and it's got liquid uh, units and all those sorts of things. So it has a bunch of units pre-built um, for you. And you can notice it's got millimeters, centimeters, and meters. So it's got actually the, the SI um, prefixes already bundled on there, and it knows how to convert among all those. And so if you use millimeters somewhere in a model and meters somewhere else in the model, it knows to scale those appropriately. Um, and then um, up here, any units you've already used in the model, it just keeps track of because it knows you'll probably use those again. So initially, this list will be empty. Uh, but you know, this year I've already used meters and meters per second inside here. It understands the word per. It also understands a slash. So there's a lot of things that makes these units a little kind of visually appealing inside Inside Maker. So, uh, but you know, it's very similar to Vincent. You click here, you click your units, and um, and then you've got the the outgoing units for this thing here. And when you click simulate, it automatically does a units check. So I can also then type in custom units. And so um, like, you know, here meters per second isn't a custom unit, but if I wanted this to be like germs per hour, if I'm talking about a growth rate, it doesn't have a germs unit. And so if I did germs per hour, if I did germs per millennia, maybe it doesn't have a millennia, it would automatically create a germs and a millennia and a germs per millennia that links them together. So you can put, you can name the units, whatever you want uh, right up there. So just like you can in Vincent. And then you can also do those synonyms. But like I said, the synonyms here, you can actually make them kind of scaled synonyms. So if I go down um, in the unit box, the, this custom conversions, if I click on that, it'll bring up a dialog where um, I can then add in synonyms just like in VinSim, but I can put scale on them. So if I already have germ in my model, I can say a foreign germ is just 15 germs. And it'll know that everywhere I use foreign germ in my model, it will internally multiply it by 15 and replace it with germs kind of behind the scenes to keep everything in the same unit. Likewise, I can say that a foreign germs plural is just one foreign germ singular, that those are just a direct synonym. Um, and then I can also say that germs plural is just one germ singular. So I can not only create the simple synonyms down here, like these two rows that I do in VinSim, but also these scaled ones up here, this is really nice. And that allows you to do things like creating a kilogerm, a millijerm, you know, a, a, a centigerm, et cetera. 
So does this make sense, this idea of the scaled synonyms for your units? Okay, any questions online about this? Okay, good. So um, what other things can we do here? Well, if I, and let's say I'm looking at the flow here. So I've clicked on this flow and it's brought up this thing here. And I've already said that flow is in meters per second. Like that's just the expected output for meters per second. Um, so whenever I refer to flow in formulas elsewhere in the model, then it will be in meters per second. But then let's say I go to the internet and I look to see what should this flow actually be based on real world data. And all the real world data I get actually specifies this flow in centimeters per second. Now, um, I could change the unit for flow, um, or I can actually put inside the, um, the, the expression here, a unit, um, what we call a unit literal. So I can put a little curly brace. So, but remember before this is just one, which would mean one meters per second. But if I put the little curly brace here, then that tells it that the thing immediately following the curly brace is the magnitude. And what's gonna come after it is the unit. And, um, and then another curly brace to close that out. And that tells Insight Maker that um, it should convert this unit into this unit. And if it doesn't know how, it'll throw up an error and say, I can't do that conversion. But it knows how to convert from centimeters or from centimeter, singular, to, to meters, plural. So it's not going to have no problem with, with this here. So if you've already built your model with certain units down here, and then you look up data that you want to then plug in and the units don't match, you can either do the conversion yourself, or if you're afraid that you're going to move the decimal the wrong way or something like that, you just put the little curly brace in, and then you can put in the units here and then let Insight Maker do the conversion for you. Does that make sense what I mean by putting literal unit in here with the curly braces? And you can then do math as well. So I could have done one centimeter per second then outside the curly brace times five or something, and then it would convert it to five centimeters per second. And then eventually then convert that into meters per second before it actually does the, the sim. Okay, questions online. So these are things that um, not as easy to do in VinSim. So it's a little bit more elegant in Insight Maker. Okay. All right, so how do we then check consistency? I already mentioned it before. If you go up to simulate, it will not run the simulation unless the units check out. So if you hit simulate and your units don't work, then it'll throw up an error and that error will tell you uh, where the mismatch is so that you can go in and fix your formula or your units, whichever one is incorrect. Okay. So questions about either of those? Or does anybody need me to... Um, to actually uh, open up in either one of those programs and do a, an example or maybe see what the errors look like or anything. All right, like I said, you'll have uh, a, a chance to practice this on the first uh, question of your homework where you have to put in the units. Um, and I think I, I do something um, where maybe you have to, like I give you most of the units, but you have to fill in one of the blank ones or something like that. So you'll have a chance to see how these work in either program. You don't have to do them both, just pick whichever one you like. Okay, so um, the other things that we can do that's gonna be, and this will be really helpful for that uh, homework as well, is something called sliders. And both Vincent and Insight Maker provide sliders. And I've got a video tutorial um, on how to do more sophisticated versions of these. But, um, but the basic idea here is, um, is that maybe I, I could build one of these and Vincent to see this live, but, um, but what we can do is if you build a model in VinSim that has constants in it, normally we hit the simulate button and then graph, but there's this little button next to simulate that's called synth the sim. And when you hit that, it will turn all of your constants. So down here, this parameter and this inflow into little sliders. And, uh, and again, I could, maybe I could do this live and it'll make more sense. Let me open up VinSim. But then the idea here is that you can drag these sliders around and then in real time, all of your dynamical variables that aren't constants will have a little uh, thumbnail of them with their, uh, with their behavior over time without any you know, axes or whatever, but just the shape of their behavior over time drawn out. 
So you'll be able to do that to be able to sort of say that you're looking for qualitative changes in system behavior, like the point where like, I'm gonna ask you to do this in the homework. I'll ask you what is the, the critical number of ships in which this fishery becomes unsustainable. And you're gonna look for a point where the fish population goes from um, being, you know, sitting at a steady value to when you drag the number of ships just one too far, it crashes. And so looking for that, that point where the fish crashes, it's a great way to just search for these parameters visually and then say, aha, without doing any of the math, that once I get up to 42 ships, that's exactly when the fishery crashes. So this fishery can only support 41 ships. As an example, I don't think that's the right answer there, but um, but just as an example. So let me bring up um, Vinsim here, and just so I can show you this real time, because it might seem a little abstract um, at this point. So, um, so I'll pull over, I have a feeling this is gonna be a little big for the screen. So let me shrink it and pull it over here. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna just do a, like a super simple example here. So I'll just do like bacteria. Um, I'll do a flow, let's call it um, births. I'll do an outflow, call it deaths. Um, I'll do a um, delete that guy that I didn't mean to put there. So then I'll do an auxiliary variable um, which will end up being a constant called death rate, and maybe this one called birth rate. Connect these things up as we've seen before. Birth rate to births, death rate to deaths, um, bacteria to deaths. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Bacteria to births, maybe. And then if I go into the equations, sure, you can save. If I go into my um, equations, which I think the equation guy is a little far out. So let me try to open this up a little bigger. There we go. And I um, I'll go into bacteria, I'll set it to a, need to get the uh, the dialogue opened up on my other screen so drag it back over here initial value of bacteria one my birth rate is just um bacteria times births or birth rate my death rate or deaths is just bacteria times death rate I'll set my birth rate to two, and I'll set my death rate to one. So right now they're being born faster than they die. So if I go and um, if I, I mean, I could just go and hit run, simulate, that's what we would normally do. And again, this would appear like nothing would happen, but if I go over here and do sim, the sim instead, then um, after I click on that guy, Oh, I've got a, um, a, so it popped up a dialogue asking me if I want to overwrite my data set, which I do. So let me get that dialogue out of the way here. So just, so yes, overwrite. Now we see that I've got sliders. And so um, it's subtle because uh, the exponential growth, but you can see that um, at this current setting, the bacteria starts flat and then it skyrockets up here at the end. Likewise, birth starts flat, skyrockets up. So I can go down here to this birth rate and I can drag it closer to the death rate. And I overshot there, but if I get it close, So right there, now my birth rate is less than my death rate. And so you can see here, now instead of growing, it declines. So I can play with these sliders and it's simulating every time I drag and let go of the slider. And so with that, I can search for these sort of critical points 
of changes in behavior in my system just by sliding this thing around. And I can do that with birth rate, I can do it with death rate. It sets up a slider for anything that doesn't have a formula, anything that's a constant. Um, birth rate is a constant, death rate is a constant, and that's why the slider showed up there. Anything that's a formula turns into a little thumbnail of the behavior over time. So that's how that works. Are there questions about that? Does that make sense, how the sliders work? Questions online? All right, so I'll go and I'm gonna go up here and hit stop, synthesim, and that makes all of that go away and it stops Vincent from trying to uh, notice changes and re-simulate. All right, so, um, and I put a tutorial on Canvas for how to do even more sophisticated things, like you can actually embed a behavior over time plot that actually has proper axes and everything that's right inside the Canvas. And then as you drag the sliders around, it'll automatically change. And so that's a little more advanced. If you're interested in seeing how to do that, I've got a tutorial to show you how to do that. All right, and we can do a very similar thing inside Insight Maker as well. So um, any constant like this new variable here, you click on it and down the right, uh, it looks a little bit different in the uh, current version of VinSim, but still down the right-hand side, there'll be a little checkbox that says show value slider. If you set that equal to yes, um, then when you click on the blank canvas, then you get sliders out here. And then you can slide those sliders around and they just change the constant here. Now it doesn't automatically simulate. It requires you to go up and hit simulate, um, but it's a quick way to change the value, hit simulate, and it'll show you results. And if you leave those results up, and then change the value again and click simulate, it'll put new results in a new window. So it's not quite as nice as VinSim. This is kind of where, in the, I think in units, Insight Maker wins, in sliders, VinSim wins, um, but it's still not that bad. So, um, so that's kind of how that works. And so we can do those sliders. And again, that just makes it so that when you hit simulate, it'll use that value um, instead of the default value that you typed in initially. So any question? about the sliders in either VinSim or Insight Maker. And I can show you how to do this in Insight Maker, but like I said, it's it's not really that exciting relative to VinSim. Um, it just makes it, you know, it's 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 just basically a shorthand for, so you don't have to click on the variable, edit the number, click on the variable, edit the number. It's just kind of a quick way to do it. Okay. Questions online? All right. Okay, so uh, I think the last thing that I want to cover today um, are lookup table converters. This is sort of the more, most sophisticated thing we're going to cover today. Um, super important. Traditionally in this class, um, one of the more difficult concepts to get used to, but we've seen them a lot so far. We're now just learning how to build them in Vinstem and Insight Maker. So lookup tables capture relationships uh, graphically instead of with a mathematical formula. So um, they're called lookup tables because in, normally with a mathematical formula, you put in an input and you calculate what the output is with an expression. But in a lookup table, you actually draw a graph relating input to output, and it looks up what the output should be based on that graph. So that graph is really like a dictionary where you can say for this input, um, this should be the output. For this other input, this should be the output. If it's an input in between them, the output should be in between those two outputs. So that's why they're called lookup uh, tables. In Insight Maker, they're called converters. It's a little confusing because we use converters a little bit more liberally in the Moorcroft text, but just have to get used to that. So again, we've already seen this. So this is our classic fishery example, which you'll see this again on that homework. And um, it's got its stock, it's got its regeneration, uh, its, its births, new fish per year. And there's this net regeneration lookup table. So if you remember, this is a graph which related fish density to the net regeneration rate for the fish population. So the idea here is that if you look kind of closely, there's a bunch of corners on this graph. So there's what, three, nine, uh, or three, six, nine of those little corners and straight lines connecting them. So you can define this graph by those, those nine points, and it just draws a line in between each one of them. And the result 
maps any density from zero to one to a bunch of regeneration rates. And so the idea here is if the simulation currently has a density of whatever this is, 0.15 or something like that, it will then um, go up and say, hit this line and say, I should make the net regeneration what, you know, where it hits on the y-axis. If the density in the simulation changes to a higher density, like up here closer to 0.5, it says the net regeneration should be up here. And we can keep doing that game, whereas the density moves around, the sim changes the net regeneration. This is so far up until this point in VinSim and Insight Maker to represent these relationships, we had to come up with a formula that said when the density is this, the re net regeneration was like density squared times five or something like that. Well, now we don't have to use a formula. We just draw out the graph of the relationship, and then we let um, VinSim and Insight Maker make this happen for us. So are there any questions about this general idea about the lookup table? Does this make sense that we're getting rid of the math expression and that allows us to do more complex relationships between inputs and outputs, um, but it requires us to write them in this kind of ugly format where we're gonna have to write in like a bunch of points that end up getting connected together in order to span the space. And this is traditionally a difficult topic in this course, just across instructors and things like that. So I want to make sure we give it enough time. So in the Moorcroft text, when you go this, now that we're, we're a little more sophisticated, we can look at his uh, fisheries model. And if we look down in the text, he always has his equations. Whenever there's a lookup table, he puts the lookup tables in there too. And that's what I want you to do as well is I need you to give me the points in your lookup table um, under if you're ever you whatever you're drawing something like this when you list your formulas, then you also have to list the points of your lookup table so like this lookup table here is identical to this one down here it's identical to this one right here. Where he says net regeneration equals graph fish density, so this is the Stella format where graph means it's a lookup table and fish density means the input is fish density and then each one of these whatever nine or ten points are represent four um, uh, pairs of fish density regeneration rate um, you know grouping so when it's uh, when you have zero for density you've got zero for regeneration rate when you have 0.1 for density you have 50 for regeneration rate 0.2 you've got 100 so if i look up here um, I can see, well, 0.2, it corresponds to 100. Um, one corresponds to zero. Zero corresponds to zero. Um, I was supposed to have 0.150. I think when I drew this, I left that point out, but because it, it's on the same line as this 0 0.150, 0 0.2, 100. Um, so that's why it doesn't look like it's there, but it's just because it's on the line there in between. But these um, nine or 10 points correspond to these nine or 10 points. So that's how we show a lookup table to our stakeholder, to our reader. We just list the points out. Does that make sense? Everybody know how we go from this to this or vice versa? Online, everybody okay? All right. So how do we implement these things? So in VinSim, the old version of VinSim, there was an advanced version of lookup tables, which I'll, I have slides on, but I'm gonna skip over them. I just left them in there if people are interested in it. And I could usually hide and say, don't worry about the advanced lookup tables. We're not gonna do it that way. We're gonna do it kind of more like Moorcroft does it. But in the new version of VinSim, they snuck their advanced lookup tables up here into this lookup in the, um, up in the, the toolbar there. And that's a, it, it's a, when you start using lookup tables, then eventually this becomes a comfortable way to do it. When you're starting out, this is not. So just forget that that lookup exists there. When I tell you, or when you draw lookup tables in your homework, unless you really want to be ambitious, um, just this is not what we want here. So don't use that lookup um, uh, button. Just imagine it doesn't exist. That lookup tool is non-existent. Instead, we're going to implement lookup tables through the equations tool. So if we were to draw this fishery model, we would just create a normal auxiliary variable, a normal variable right here called net regeneration. And then we would go into the equations button, just like any other variable. And when we do that, it brings up the equations box. And up here under type, uh, we're going to leave it as auxiliary. That will be the default 
type for anything that has something coming into it. So if it has an input, it'll automatically make the type auxiliary. But then under subtype, we're going to make this with lookup. If you happen to click on type, one of the other types is lookup. That's that advanced one that I don't want you to use. So, uh, you know, don't give in to the temptation to click on type and go down to lookup. Type will always be auxiliary. Leave it as auxiliary. Only use subtype with lookup. And that'll make it just like how Moorcroft has it. That way we can be consistent across the class and it'll also make it consistent with Insight Maker. So subtype with lookup. Then what do we do after that? Well, in this upper box where it says with lookup, we put the input to the lookup table, the horizontal axis. So in this case, it's fish density. That's the only thing coming into the lookup table, the only thing we're allowed to use there. And then we need to put our lookup table into this box down here. Now we can manually type it in if we're really, you know, we know our stuff. But fortunately, there's a little button called as graph that makes it a lot easier to put this thing in. We click on this as graph, and then it gives us this box where we can input all our points in. And so you can either use your mouse and click around the lookup table so that you can uh, put these point points in visually, or you can just type them in. So you can go down here under new and type a new point in, or you can go up here and uh, you can edit a point, you can delete a point and so on. And so if uh, somebody gives you 10 points, you just fill in the 10 points here and it draws them out. Um, and then um, just for visualization purposes, you can change the limits for the horizontal limits um, and the vertical limits. Um, and that can make it sort of look a little bit better as you're, you're putting it through here. Uh, and so, um, and then I think you can also, um, I don't think you specify the fish, the, the, the units, the output units for the lookup table are still specified here, but it will just remind you of the units over here that, by the way, you're specifying fish per year. So make sure you're scaling your output appropriately. So even though the units show up here, you edit the units back on the previous screen. So this is how you enter lookup tables in to uh, VinSim. So any questions about this process? I'm gonna happy to show you that if that's helpful. Questions online? There are little shortcuts down here, clear all points, clear points, et cetera. Okay. So then after you click OK to that graph, then down here, it shows you a list of points. So um, it shows you over here, the first thing is going to show you the bottom point, the bottom corner of your graph and the top corner of your graph. That's just for visualization. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, but then after that, um, it shows you all of the points that you put in there. So again, once you do this enough, you start recognizing the syntax, you can start reading it. Eventually you actually get to the point where you can actually just start typing that out uh, without ever having to even go through the as graph. But for the purpose of this class, it's totally okay to use that as graph tool uh, to simplify this. And then once you've done that, um, and so this is me just saying that's the, the range, see the bottom left and the upper right. And then these are your nine or 10 points. So those points match up with these points where again, I forgot when I implemented this and add that point, but um, otherwise they're all the same. So everything clear, any questions? Yeah. Um, so like when you're reporting it like in a, in a Word doc, yeah, you, when you report your equations, I want you to tell me all of your equations, all of your initial conditions, and if you have lookup tables, all the points that are in your lookup table. Everything that someone else would need to hand draw your simulation and reproduce it. All right, any other questions? Great. All right, so with that, if I went and go and simulate this, I get something that looks like this, which matches what uh, Moorcroft got. So my, um, he plotted both the population and the regeneration rate and his um, regeneration rate went up to a thousand and mine went up to 600, like just the axes. So that's the reason why this little spiky thing is a little bit, looks higher than this one. It's just a, the axis scaling, but otherwise I get the same results that he does. So um, I was able to re-implement, you know, what he had in the book there and you could too. All right, so that's um, Vinsim. So how do we do lookup tables in Insight Maker? 
Um, Lookup tables and Inside Maker are very similar. Um, oh, so right. Uh, so uh, I'm going to skip these slides, but just if you're interested in using that fancy lookup tool or seeing how to use, use type lookup to build things that look like this, where it's a little weird, where the fish density goes into new fish per year and the lookup table itself looks like a constant going in, um, then you're welcome to, to try this out. Um, but, uh, but I'm going to skip this, uh, but, but I'm just leaving the slides in there for you to have that info about how that works. Something else that I just want to mention um, is if you combine this with SynthSim, this or the other one, if you click on lookup tables while SynthSim is turned on, you can edit the lookup tables in real time. So that's kind of cool that you can drag those points around as the simulation is running. So I'm not going to ask you to do that, but I'm just letting you know that you can do that. Kind of a neat feature. So I'm just going to skip through those slides, those extra slides. So that we can get back to how to do lookup tables in Insight Maker. Or I'm sorry, we'll do advanced lookup tables and then we'll go to Insight Maker. All right. So um, so advanced lookup tables in in um, in Vincent. So um, so this let's say I've got uh, you know a, a savings account balance. What I want um, us to be able to do is have an interest rate that changes with time. So. Um, if we wanted a constant interest rate, so say our savings account balance had a, you know, one percent interest rate, uh, we knew we know how to do that. But I want to be able to actually take in time as an input and turn this interest rate into a lookup table where I can actually schedule different interest rates at different times of the year. That's my goal here. So um, let's start with the simple example of the fixed interest rate. So if I draw this in VinSim, got a stock savings account balance, a flow going in interest a constant fixed interest rate coming in here. Um, and so these are my equations for each one of these. And so the stock, I don't ever touch the intake. I just do my initial value, 100 bucks in there initially. The interest rate or the interest flow is just going to be the savings account balance times the interest rate. And then the fixed interest rate is just this constant where let's say I did 10% APR. Well, that would mean 10% divided by 12 compounded every month. And so that's why I do 10% divided by 12, but it's just a constant put inside here. So that's how I do the fixed interest rate case. Now, um, and then if I were to simulate that, I'd get something that looked like this, where the blue line is my fixed interest rate, which is constant, and the interest generated is the red, and the actual money in the account is the green. So that's our simple simulation of our bank account. Now, what if the interest is not fixed? What if it changes over time? January is one interest rate, uh, February is another interest rate, and so on. How do we implement that? Very similar, but we're going to turn fixed interest rate into a lookup table, and we're going to show you how to introduce time as a variable which you can use. So I need to do the time thing first. And so there's this thing up here called shadow variable. Um, and that's what we're introducing, these shadow variables. Now, in the new version of VinSim, there's not only shadow variables, but there's something else next to it called existing variable. Ignore that. Um, I can talk to you about how to use that existing variable, but it's a little more advanced. And it's really just a visualization thing. So ignore the existing variable. It looks really similar to shadow variable. Make sure you click on shadow variable when you're doing that. So you click on shadow variable, and it'll pop up this thing, and it'll show you all variables that already exist, plus a few special variables that are hidden behind the scenes that you now can get access to, one of them being time. So if I click on shadow variable, pops this thing up, I click on time, and then I pluck, plop down a time right there, then that acts like a variable, which actually gives me access to how, um, what the, the clock is inside my simulation model. So shadow variables are aliases to existing variables. So other ways I could use this is let's say um, you know, I've noticed um, interest or notice savings account balance shows up here as well. If I wanted to draw other things on my model down here, but I didn't want to create long range connections between here because it just would look ugly like to have all these lines run across my model, I can create a shadow variable for savings account balance. It'll create like a little copy of it down here and it'll look like that. It'll have little brackets around it, it'll be grayed out down here. And any links that go to or from that shadow variable effectively go to or from the original variable as well. So it allows you to sort of create a ghost copy 
a shadow copy of uh, whatever your um, your uh, whatever variable you point to, and again, you have access to all of them, and then you can use them elsewhere in your diagram, and that can simplify the drawing of the diagram. So it simplifies the drawing of connections, and it gives you access to a few variables that are behind the scenes, like time. So that's what shadow variables are. So any questions about that? What I mean by shadow variables? So in this case, we're just trying to get time out there. Questions online too. Okay, so I've got access to time. So this is just like, um, it's whatever unit you put your time units in. Let's say you put your time units in as seconds, and this would be seconds since the beginning of the simulation. That number comes out of time and then you can make use of it. So what I can do now is go into my new variable interest rate instead of fixed interest rate. I change it, um, you know, it was an auxiliary, but I do the with lookup again. And time now shows up as one of my inputs, as I would expect, since I drew it as an input coming in here. Um, I again change this to be with lookup based on time. And then under my as graph, I can create um, a, uh, a schedule of interest rates. Now, in my case, I set my time unit in this case for months. Um, and so I said I want to define interest rates to change over a four year period. So I define my minimum for this lookup table as zero, zero months, my maximum to 48 months. And so if I'm simulating for 48 months, then this lookup table allows me to change my interest rate so that it's uh, this much for so many months. So for the first year, so notice that, so it's this uh, interest rate up until about the 12th month. And then it jumps down to this interest rate for another roughly 12 months. And then it jumps up to this interest rate for another roughly 12 months, jumps down to about nothing for half a year, jumps up to an interest rate for a quarter of a year, and then jumps up for the rest of the year to there. So I can define um, an interest rate that's jumping all around, um, you know, just by, and then I've got all these points here. So this thing I actually did graphically, which is why these numbers aren't quite perfect but just shows that you can click on the graph to create these. And I can create these nearly vertical steps as well through this process. So this is still about the same. All that's new is I use the time variable instead. All right, so with that, I can run my simulation and now I get very different result. So the um, interest rate is the blue line and notice the interest rates jumping all around. So not surprisingly, um, the interest, which is, um, Oh, sorry, the, the interest rate is green, which is jumping all around. So not surprisingly, the interest, which is blue, is kind of following it. So it's jumping around as well. And so the savings account is growing, but you can see it's growing at different rates. And so it grows kind of quickly here. It sort of slows down a little bit. It speeds up. It really slows down here. Notice it's got a kind of a corner. And then it starts picking back up again. So we can get more complex uh, you know, rates of change here. So any questions about this output? Does this make sense what we did here? We just coupled time to the interest rate. Okay. All right, so how do we do that then in um, Insight Maker? So um, this is the old interface, but uh, basically the controls are in uh, the same place in the new interface. So it's easy to find them. They're just all the names are the same and they're roughly the same positions. You go up to add primitive and you go down to add converter. Remember converter is their name for lookup table in Insight Maker. It creates this differently shaped box here. And on the right hand side, when you click on it, then it's got all of the information about the lookup table. In the new version of Insight Maker, um, it actually puts the lookup table right here on the right hand side. In the old version, you had to click on a little equal sign and then it would blow that up to edit it. But you can actually edit right on the right hand side here. So, um, and but it's got a couple of settings that I want to focus on here. So, um, one of the things here is under input source, there are shadow variables in Insight Maker. Um, they're called ghost primitives, but time isn't one of them. The only ghost primitives in Insight Maker are just to make copies of everything else that you've drawn. It's not to get access to these hidden ones. Time is the big hidden one. And it knows that 
you'll frequently want to build lookup tables that use time as an input. So when you, you pull in a lookup table or a converter, right here on the right under input source, if you've connected things to it, this will be a drop-down box. And you can either select time as the input or one of the things you've drugged and connected to it. And so that's all it is there. So we can default to time for this problem. And then notice it had this weird thing called interpolation. It defaults to linear. And so when we edit the lookup table, so these points will show up on the right-hand side when you're, uh, when you're doing that. They're really easy to get to in the new version of, of uh, so before you had to click on this little equal sign and then it would pop up, but now they just put it right on that right-hand side. And you've got all your points here. And what this linear does is it kind of connects the points like Moorcroft does and like Vincent does. It creates them with straight lines. If I set this linear to none, then it puts them in steps. And so this way, I don't have to kind of create these false corners. This none makes it so that it holds this value until the next value. So I can very quickly go from linear to, um, to none, and it automatically adds these, uh, these steps for me without me having to add in all these extra kind of false corners. Does that distinction make sense, linear to none? I mean, clearly the graphs look very different, is that you know all of the nuns will always have these horizontal steps, whereas in the linears, it connects them with these kind of diagonal connections instead. But the lookup tables work the same. All right, so with that, um, I can build the same model that I did in VinSim, and I get the same output. So I've got my variable um, interest rate is the blue line. It changes over time, just like it did in uh, VinSim. I've got my savings account balance. And so you can see it grows fast. It grows a little bit slower, fast again, slower, uh, fast. So this looks different than VinSim because I think I used a different lookup table when I drew this, but the same idea here. If I use the same lookup table, I would have gotten the same out. So any questions on this? Lookup tables in time in Insight Maker. Okay. All right, now um, you can also do, as I said before, um, lookup tables based on inputs. So if you were to, if I instead was a link savings account balance into the interest rate under input source, I could select savings account balance instead of time. And then I could create a lookup table that was based on the current savings account balance. So this would be like a bank where they're saying um, under, you know, so like initially we'll give you a 10% interest rate, but if you give us more than hundred bucks, we'll raise that to 20% and that will keep going up um, so that when you're like 200 bucks, it'll max out at a 50% interest rate. No bank would do that, but you, you kind of see where I'm going with this. But if you end up getting more than 500 bucks in your account, we'll bring it back down to less than 10%. So this is the thing where now we're making the interest rate depend on the savings account balance, not on the time. So that's another thing we can do with this lookup table. And by doing that, we can simulate and, um, and we get like, here's the interest rate. You can see it um, as the savings account crosses those critical thresholds here, you see the interest rate jump up and down in these steps. But um, in this relationship here, you get this smooth growth, but you get like, a rapid exponential growth and then a slow exponential growth and then kind of intermediate exponential growth um, here. So then that's, this is your, um, your, your uh, savings account balance and that's the interest rate. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, questions online? With regard to uh, which one's nicer, lookup tables in Insight Maker or VinSim, I kind of like the linear interpol uh, the interpolation linear versus none option. Um, I kind of like that you don't have to dig for time in sort of a uh, in a shadow variable, but otherwise I think it's pretty much a tie. Um, which one's uh, which one's better? So, all right. So those are the three big things that I wanted to show you. Not a whole lot here. Um, I think I gave myself a little bit more time because I uh, wanted to make sure I could demo them. Um, so before I do any of this sort of summary stuff, does anybody need to see any demos of those in VinSim or Insight Maker? Because I had the time. So I got here a little late. I was afraid I was, I was running low on time, but looks like I had plenty.
Anybody online, any other questions or need me to see something demoed? Um, I do, maybe I actually do want to bring up, uh, let me at least show you briefly because it is a different interface. Um, this, uh, the Insight Maker version of these things. So, I mean, under um, Insight Maker, uh, like I said, if I go into like converter, if I bring a converter in, um, then on the right hand side here, you can see that it actually puts the lookup table immediately graphically displayed and you can edit the points uh, right down here and you can edit the time source here. And if I scroll down, then it's got the interpolation option there and I can choose my units as before. So, um, so this uh, converter uh, does uh, have all the same options, but they're just in a very different uh, format. So that's one of the big differences there. Um, otherwise, I think uh, most of the other things that I demonstrated, um, I already had changed the units. I showed you how to do units already. Um, the unit conversions I showed you, uh, I forget what we did in between. Um, so, um, but yeah, so the converter was sort of the biggest thing then that uh, was different than the units. So, yeah, so any, any, um, like I said, is anybody need to see, oh, the sliders, that was the other thing. So if I bring in a variable inside here, I can go and edit its values down this side. Um, and if I say enable value slider, um, I can put the slider here and I can even specify things like um, what you know step do I want the slider? So um, do I want this as like 0.1 steps? So when I click on the, if I go back to new variable, enable slider, got my steps. Then down here, I can slide that around and you can see it slides in these 0.1 steps. So that's something that, um, and I guess we'll see save insight. So then now if I, if I, if it's saved, it gets rid of that box. And then now you can see when I click away, then it's got this slider here. And as I drag it, it, it um, as I move it left and right again, it moves in these 0.1 steps because I set that as a step size. And if I went and simulate, nothing's gonna happen here because I don't have any stocks and flows. But if I went and simulated it, it would generate one um, plot. And then if I hit, uh, adjusted the variable and hit simulate it again, it would generate another plot and I can put them next to each other to compare. So it's not quite as nice as VinSim, but um, it's not bad. It's still a lot faster than editing these things manually. So, all right. So those are the, the kind of the biggest differences between the old Inside Maker and the new Inside Maker. So, so you feel good about that? All right. So um, only other announcements here. So uh, this is lecture E1. So we'll do E2 on Tuesday, E3 on Thursday. So E4 will be a week from Tuesday. So that's the first chapter we have to worry about, chapter six of Moorcroft. Um, we're skipping chapters four and five, although um, you know these are not bad chapters just to skim through. When we start talking about delays next time, it does relate to some content in chapter four, but I just didn't want you guys to take the time to read through it. Um, otherwise, there's a muddiest point on Canvas. Uh, not a lot to talk about this week, just the stuff from today. Uh, reading exercise E4, again, that's, you know, you pretty much got a week and a half to worry about that. The biggest thing is this final project names of team members. I already mentioned this, it's due Sunday night. It's an individual assignment. Every team member has to submit it. That way I can make sure everybody agrees on who's in their team. Once you do that, I'll create groups on Canvas. And then every other deliverable after that will be a group assignment. So about uh, I don't know, a week or so after that, you'll have to submit a very short um, one, one and a half, two pages max um, pro a proposal where you're basically, um, and you can look online uh, in the project proposal um, module for information about, uh, or the final project module for information about the proposal. But basically you say, this is the system I wanna model. You know, give me a paragraph, why is this a good system? These are the variables that I think I, you know, there might be more, but these are the ones I definitely think are involved. Um, it would be great. Um, I think uh, I think I actually might require it 
you'd have a, a, a basic causal loop diagram to say not only these are the variables that are involved, but um, in my conceptual model, this variable has an impact on this, this variable has an impact on this, and so those are the things that I'm you know, going to have to model. Um, so that goes into your project proposal for me to review that, see if it's overly ambitious or too simple and so on, and give you some advice on that. Um, and then after that, I pretty much leave you alone, uh, but we do have a couple of times where we'll use time in class that you can use to work with your group. Um, and then we also have a check-in assignment where you'll show me a basic simplified working version of your model, but that's not for quite a while. Um, and then otherwise, assignment E2 is available. You can do question one purely based on what you've talked about today. Question two will require what it's been talking about on Tuesday. So any questions about process going forward? Questions online? If not, then, then I skipped a couple of these because again, I thought I was gonna be running way behind. Uh, but let's do the attendance exercise then. So I'm just putting it in the chat. And the uh, question for today is, um, what does Insight Maker call um, its uh, lookup tables? So if you are, if you want to add a lookup table in Insight Maker, and you go to that add primitive, what is the thing down the add primitive menu that Insight Maker uses as its name for lookup tables? It's a name that we use more generically in the Moorcroft text, uh, but uh, they use specifically to talk about in, uh, talk about lookup tables. So if you don't remember, that's totally fine. Just put something that's coherent, um, graded for kind of coherence and completion, not correctness. And that's all I've got for you. So I hope you have a good weekend. Again, if you have any questions about the midterm results, let me know. Any remaining questions online? If not, I will go ahead and end the room and rush back to my lab to try to fix an incubator. Have a good weekend.